Good morning from London. Today I'm going to be joined by my friend Edward Lucas. But first, here's an update. Russia continues to fail on the battlefield and in the Black Sea. We all recently watched a Ukrainian drone strike against the Black Sea fleet in Sevastopol. Maritime drones, as well as air drones, hit several different vessels. We don't know the final damage assessment yet, but once again, Ukraine has demonstrated an amazing ability to use technology, clever tactics, surprise, to demonstrate to the Russians that they are not safe anywhere, that Crimea is not safe. This is an important part of the effort because it not only gives confidence to the Ukrainian people, but it also communicates to the Russians that Ukraine is not going to stop. Unsurprisingly, the Kremlin has cried foul, calling this a terrorist attack because the attacks were against Russian Navy ships that were being used allegedly to provide security for grain shipments as part of the grain deal. What a bunch of crybabies. There are Ukrainian villages that are getting nine or 10 drone strikes every week, yet the Ukrainians continue to fight back. Based on recent developments in Ukraine, I remain very confident in my earlier assessments about how the war is going to progress. First, I still believe that Ukrainian forces are going to push Russian forces back to the 23 February line by the end of this year. Secondly, I believe that Ukrainian forces are going to liberate Crimea by summer next year. Why do I remain so confident? We know that war is a test of will, and Ukrainian will continues to be very strong, both with the soldiers as well as the population. Uh, from my conversations with Ukrainian politicians, military leaders, and civilians, it's obvious that Ukrainian morale still remains very high. The second development is that the logistical system continues to get better for Ukraine. Nations are continuing to contribute equipment, weapons, and ammunition. Developments around Kherson are particularly important. The going is slow. Uh, the wet weather has made the terrain more difficult for wheeled vehicles but track vehicles are still able to fight. And I continue to be impressed with how the Ukrainian general staff has used long range precision fires to continue to knock out the bridges, to make it difficult for Russian forces to bring in reinforcements or supplies. They continue to tighten the noose around the thousands of Russian soldiers that are on the right bank of the Dnipro River. Part of the Kremlin narrative, of course, is that they are trying to evacuate civilians out of Kherson. They've moved about 70,000 Ukrainians out of Kherson, supposedly for their safety, but what's really happening, of course, is this is just another step in the Russian effort to depopulate Ukraine. As this war continues to progress, and as Ukraine gets closer and closer to the end game and victory, the world needs to remember that over a million Ukrainian men, women, and children have been kidnapped and deported to Russia, and that part of the outcome of this war is that they need to be brought back home. The West has continued to provide weapons. It's especially important that Ukraine receive adequate air and missile defense capabilities to protect populations, power grid, and en energy infrastructure from attacks by drones provided by Iran to Russia, and also continued cruise missile attacks against civilian targets. It is a war crime to target civilian infrastructure that does not have direct military application. And this is what the Kremlin is doing uh, every single week against most of Ukraine's cities and, and towns. We've talked about the requirement for air and missile defense, uh, the requirement for continued long-range precision fires. What we really need, though, we need a policy change that would allow the United States to provide the ATACMS missile. This is the missile that's fired off of a HIMARS launcher. It has a range of 300 kilometers. If Ukraine had the ATACMS missile today, they could already be hitting airfields, ammunition storage, and Navy bases in Crimea. Without ATACMS, Ukrainian forces will have to continue to grind forward, moving towards Crimea until they can get HIMARS in range with the 80 kilometer GMLRS rockets that they're using to start hitting Russian targets inside Crimea. Meanwhile, Russia is able to launch airstrikes, cruise missiles, and drones from Crimea against Ukrainian cities and civilian populations. The range differential between what Ukraine is able to do and what Russia is able to do allows the continued murder of innocent Ukrainians. Until Ukraine has the ability to hit the points from which Russia is launching missile strikes 
and drone strikes and air strikes against Ukrainian civilian targets, they're going to continue to do this. This is why ATACMS is so important. I'm here today with Edward Lucas, my friend and longtime Kremlin watcher. Edward, really happy that you're here. Thanks, Andy. One of the questions that always comes up is, what if the Kremlin uses the nuclear weapon? What are the chances of that? Why would they? What would be the implications? I think the fact that we're talking about it shows how successful the Kremlin's information operations have been. This is fundamentally not a war of nukes. It's a war of nerves. And instead of thinking, why did Putin launch this war? Why is the war going so badly for Putin? Why is the West getting its act together? Why are the Ukrainians resisting so strongly? Which are the real questions. Instead, our attention is sidetracked onto this question of will Russia use nuclear weapons? And it's really worth remembering, nuclear weapons work only really as a deterrent. They're not a way of winning a war. There are no circumstances in which the use of a nuclear weapon would put Russia in a better military position. The whole aim of this nuclear saber rattling and nuclear saber waving is to demoralize the West. It's not demoralizing the Ukrainians. Edward, you know the Kremlin uh, as well as anybody. I can't imagine that everybody that's there around Vladimir Putin actually thinks this is a good idea, even to be threatening the use of nukes. Is there support for doing this inside the Kremlin? And also, what do you imagine the Chinese and Indians and others are saying to the Kremlin? The rivets are popping on the Russian political machine. There was real unhappiness in the general staff about this war. They thought that it was being fought in the wrong way. They didn't like the orders they were given. They didn't like the micromanagement. We see commanders such as Kadyrov, the head of the fearsome Chechen militia, out on his own political maneuvers. Uh, people like Yevgeny Prigozhin of the Wagner Group also carving out political turf. So as well as the military battle on the ground in Ukraine, there's a political battle for the future leadership of Russia. Because I think that this is Putin's last winter. I think his uh, reputation for invincibility, his reputation for good decision making, have taken a fatal blow as a result of this disastrous war in Ukraine. There's a really interesting question about China. China hates this war. China doesn't like the rocketing prices for food and fuel and fertilizer, which are all big impediments to Xi Jinping's attempts to get the Chinese economy back on track after COVID. China doesn't want Russia to lose the war, and they don't want it to escalate, and they're not willing to give Russia the kind of unconditional backing that Russia would need to turn the military tide. And I think if Russia was to choose to use a nuclear weapon, one of the phone calls that would come in very quickly would be from Xi Jinping saying, don't do this, this is a really bad idea. If you do this, the whole essence of our Russia-Chinese partnership is under fatal strain. China has a kind of treaty obligation to defend other members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and particularly Russia. And it's interesting that that treaty has got a codicil in it, which it means it applies to the territory of the Russian Federation pre-2014. It doesn't apply to the territories that they've gained by supposedly annexing them from Ukraine. They don't want to see the Russian Federation lose this war dramatically because that would be good for America and bad for their plan to become the most important country in the world towards the middle of this century. But equally, they don't want to see this flare up and become really destabilizing because what China wants more than anything else is stability. It's stability, global stability, that gives them the chance to keep getting richer and get the things that they need. And they are really annoyed with Vladimir Putin for launching this war, which has provoked an era of global instability, as far as they see it. So I guess friends without limits actually do have limits. It's a friendship without limits until you hit the limits. Edward, I've, uh, I've listened to you uh, for years now and, and, and read what you've written about Russian propaganda, disinformation, um, how they craft narratives. How would you assess how they're doing right now? Because now you have Republicans, Elon Musk, others parroting Kremlin talking points almost. The war was disastrous at the beginning for Russia's image and it pushed support, outright support for Putin, really just to the far right and the far left of the political spectrum in most Western countries and gave a tremendous boost to the people who've been warning for years that there was a serious problem with Russia, that we need to show solidarity with 
um, the East Europeans and across the Atlantic. But things have begun to move back a bit since then, partly because of war weariness, and there are people who will say, yes, Putin's very bad, the war's a bad thing, but in the end, isn't the worst peace better than the best war? It must be possible to come to some diplomatic solution, and of course that is code for throwing the Ukrainians under a bus in the hope of getting back to the supposedly safe and comfortable world we had before February. Is it, is it accurate to say that we have deterred ourselves, that we have overestimated the risk of a Russian escalation of some sort, and so as a result of that, we continue to stop just short of saying we want Ukraine to win, or providing certain capabilities that would accelerate Ukrainian victory, but there's this cloud of we don't want World War III, we don't want them to escalate. That's absolutely right. This fear of escalation is kind of mental prison that we have put ourselves into and locked ourselves. Um, we, we've gone into this cage and we've padlocked it and swallowed the key. And that was really stupid. And we are now doing far more than we thought was possible back in February. Yeah. If we'd done in February what we're doing now, there wouldn't be a war. So we are always making things too little and too late, and we're doing that because we're scared of so-called so provoking the Russians. And yet we end up doing it. We just have to wait until another thousand, another 10,000 Ukrainians have died, until there's been a bit more destruction, and then we think, oh yes, okay, we need to send them this weapon system after all, we need to do this, this extra thing. So the Ukrainians are washing away with their blood the marks that these lines in the sand that Russia's trying to draw. And in the end, the lines don't exist, the blood's there, and we go ahead and do what we should have done anyway. Ever Thanks very much for that. That's it for this week from London. I'm Ben Hodges. I look forward to seeing you next time.